Ian drove the car at a frightening speed, while the sound of gunshots rang out loudly through the dark. Both Madison's and Allie's hearts were in their throats, and they shut their eyes tightly, not daring to look at what was happening. The car swerved left and right, and they were flung from one side of the vehicle to the other. Madison reached out to catch and protect Allie, thinking about the child that she was carrying. She hoped that her friend would get through this all right. Madison pursed her lips tightly and turned to stare at the people chasing after them. They were drawing in close, and suddenly Ian made a left turn, taking the car to the other side of the road. He sped away in the opposite direction, and the vehicle behind him followed his actions. They could hear the sounds of tires screeching against the road, followed by more gunshots. They were breathing nervously and beginning to sweat. Madison opened her eyes and looked at the man driving the car her eyes full of worry. Through the rear rear mirror, Ian caught her eye and gave her a small smile. He wouldn't let anybody hurt her. The chase went on, and after a while, they met with another car on the road. Inside was Shane. He took out a gun and aimed it at the tires of the car chasing them. Four shots sounded in the air, blocking out the screeching of tires. The car came to a stop, and Shane got out with a serious expression on his face. However, as he made to take a step forward, the man got out of the other car and fired a round of bullets in their direction. He didn't seem to care what happened to him. Madison held Allie tightly in her arms, and Ian lowered his head to protect himself. Only Shane was outside shooting at the men. A few more shots were exchanged, and the scene finally quieted a little. There was a light coming from close by. Someone must have come. The man quickly got back into the car, and he and his companion fled the scene. Shane threw himself into his own car and set out after them. Ian only let Madison and Allie exit the car after Francis brought people over and made sure that it was safe outside. Their faces were pale with fright. They were terrified by the experience they just had. Mr. Weston, there's an emergency at St. Mary's Hospital. Three patients have had their organs removed today. Francis told Ian, speaking freely in front of Madison and Allie. Lynn was supposed to be the fourth. Madison's and Allie's faces paled even further. Ian reached out and took Madison's hand, comforting her. However, the look he gave Francis was fierce. Francis became angry and touched his nose. He hadn't expected Ian to get scared by a few words after being in a gunfight. Then, Madison remembered that Luke and Lynn had been together at the hospital and her expression changed. Luke had let her down, but she still didn't wish for him to experience something so disastrous. The people had been chasing them because they had ruined their plans, and Luke and Lynn had been left in the hospital. One of them was under heavy medication, but Madison didn't know anything about the other. Ian, she began, Luke and Lynn. She didn't have to finish her sentence. It was obvious what she wanted to say. Ian was silent for a moment and then replied, You're in no state to go over there right now. I'll go and make sure everything's all right. I want you to go back and rest. We'll talk tomorrow. Madison thought about Allie. Even the matter with her grandmother had been set aside with everything that had happened. Smuggling and selling organs was a horrifying thing. Half of the night had passed when Madison brought Allie back to her in Ian's apartment. However, neither of them could fall asleep still haunted by everything that they had experienced. She thought about what had happened in the hospital. Three people had been hollowed out, their organs stolen. She wondered how the people who did this could be so fearless. She felt lightheaded just thinking about it. The victims had been left as hollow shells. Madison had also heard about some especially ruthless gangs that kidnapped people and took out their organs while they were still conscious. Allie wasn't doing as well as Madison. She was over a month into her pregnancy, and she was having all kinds of reactions to the night's events. The bloody scenes flashed through her mind. She got up and rushed into the bathroom to vomit. Madison went after her and stood by her side. She got her a glass of water and softly caressed her back as she retched, unable to get anything out of her system. After a long time, Allie almost collapsed down onto Madison. Madison held her silently for a moment, and then finally asked something that she'd been wondering about. Allie, 
Can you tell me who the child's father is? Allie's body stiffened, and she shook her head. She didn't tell Madison anything, and Madison didn't press the matter. If you don't want to tell me, then don't, Madison thought. Meanwhile, Allie was falling into despair at the thought of Madison finding out one day. However, this strangely also gave her a bit of hope. Early the next morning, Madison turned on the television to find that the news was broadcasting what had happened at the hospital the previous day. The two women watched the broadcast with eyes wide open, shocked at the extent to which the situation had developed. The matter had been exposed at such a grand scale because Lynn had been sent to the hospital due to her wrist injury the very same day, and Luke had found out that there had been something wrong. The victim's devastated families had already arrived at the scene the previous night. They were blaming themselves, as they had believed that the doctor's suggestions had been good and let him carry out a full-body examination. They had all been out to the city at the same time of the procedure, and had never thought that something like this would happen. They had been told by the doctors and nurses that it would be inconvenient to disturb the patients while they were sleeping, so they hadn't visited them. They had allowed the criminals a chance to get to their victims. Lynn had been the intended fourth victim. Although Luke and the police had managed to find her in time, the criminals hadn't been afraid of being caught. There had even been a fight between them and the police. Luke had rushed into the operating room to save his sister and had taken a shot to the shoulder. The situation was currently being investigated, and a report would be made once the police had more information. Luke is injured. What about Ian? Madison thought, panicking. She picked up her phone and called her husband. However, the phone continued ringing with no answer from the other side. She waited for a long time, getting more and more anxious with each dial, until Ian finally answered. When she heard his voice, she started crying. This was also removed from the life she knew. She had never thought that she would encounter an organ trafficking group in her life. However, the previous night, everything had happened right in front of her eyes. Madison? Ian said softly into the phone. He sounded tired. What's wrong? Ian, she said through heavy sobs, are you all right? Ian was taken aback by her question. It was only then that he realized he hadn't called to check in if she was okay the entire night. The news of Luke's injury would have already spread, and she must have been afraid that something had happened to him, too. Don't worry, I'm okay, he assured her, smiling gently. He could feel the exhaustion leaving him. Madison nodded her head with a sniffle. Then she could hear a voice simultaneously coming from the phone and the television. I'm a ballerina. I will be the most famous ballerina in the world. <laughs> Madison turned to look at the screen and saw Lynn. There were traces of blood on her white sweater, and they seemed to be getting bigger and bigger. It seemed that her wound had been torn. However, no one dared approach her as she was holding a scalpel in her hand. Everyone in the hospital hallway stared at Lynn in surprise, wondering what was going on with her. She stepped forward, her feet bare. Her messy hair fluttered around as she danced about. Ha ha ha, I want to be the best ballerina in the world. I want to dance white swan. I want to dance black swan, too. I want to be better than everyone else, she muttered as she spun her face full of determination and longing. I want to be better than Claire. I want every man in the world to fall in love with me. <laughs> I'm the best. Her strange behavior left everyone dumbfounded, and it took them a while to come to their senses. Ian frowned and said goodbye to Madison before hanging up the phone. On the television, Madison could see people quickly arriving on the scene. Zoe's eyes were red, and she seemed to be in pain. She looked at Emmett, her face full of anger and heartache. Kelsey watched Lynn in surprise. She was fine yesterday. Had she gone crazy? She wondered. The last time Lynn had been on the news, it was because of her fight. At that time, she had been arrogant, but now something was obviously wrong with her. Lights flashed around her like crazy. Everyone waited with bated breath, but nobody dared to act or say anything. Lynn had obviously lost her mind. She stopped dancing and looked at the scalpel in her hand blankly. She tilted her head to the side curiously and murmured in a daze, Why am I holding this? The next second, 
She made an abrupt movement. She lifted her clothes high with her free hand, revealing a badly mutilated belly. A terrified scream came from a woman in the crowd. The people turned their heads away, not daring to watch. Zoe was so scared that she fainted. Kelsey quickly supported her and slowly approached Emmett and Luke. The police were slowly closing in. Lynn seemed to come to her senses when she heard the scream, and she stopped moving just before the scalpel she was holding reached her body. Only an inch further, and it would have broken through her skin. Lynn looked at the screaming woman and asked, What? Why do I have this? Someone else should have it. Someone else should be cutting me open. A deafening silence ensued. The operation Lynn had been subjected to must have begun before her anesthesia had fully unfolded. She had probably seen the doctor holding the scalpel to operate on her. Both Lynn and Luke were scared, but Luke was even more terrified than her. He would never forget the scene before him. When he had rushed into the operating room, he had seen his sister lying on the table, with a doctor holding a scalpel standing above her. He had been preparing to remove her organs. He could see her opened up, her heart beating and her lungs moving slightly. The impact of the scene had been huge on Luke, and he hadn't even had time to fully process it before he had rammed into the doctor, pushing him away from Lynn. However, in doing this, he had also bumped into the operating table, pushing it away and causing Lynn to hit her head against a medical instrument beside it. Fortunately, Ian and his men had rushed over quickly. There had been people in the room with guns, and they had begun firing at them. Luke and the others had mostly managed to avoid the shots before the police had arrived and the group of criminals had begun to disperse. After that, Lynn felt no shame in having her body exposed before everyone. She was almost naked before so many people held the scalpel. She seemed to be recalling the doctor's movements from before. Why? she asked. Why did you try to get inside? Is there something inside? Right, that's right. There's an elf inside me. I want to save it. I can save it. She continued mumbling senselessly, obviously out of her mind. From the state of her belly, it was evident that she had been operated on before being opened up and that her wounds had been sutured. Her face was completely void of color, yet she still had enough energy to create such a terrifying scene. When they again saw the scalpel move closer to the bleeding wound, Emmett and Luke both shouted out in unison, Lynn! She turned to them, face blank, but made no move to take the scalpel away from her body. Suddenly, she flung it away from herself and onto the ground in a rapid movement. Then, she curled up on herself and began to scream at the top of her lungs. No! No, don't take my heart. Please don't kill me. I want to live. Please! I don't want to die! She sobbed miserably and then muttered. No, no, please don't. I don't want to save the elf. I don't want it anymore. Please don't take my heart. No, please. I don't want... In the end, Emmett couldn't hold it in anymore and burst into tears. Luke quickly stepped forward and kicked the scalpel away from his sister. Then he grabbed her tightly in his arms. She struggled against him, beating him with her fists and trying to kick him. His clothes were quickly soaked with her blood. He was pale and weak, obviously tired but he still didn't let go. Lynn, Lynn, don't be afraid. I'm here now. Your big brother is here. No one's going to hurt you now. He pacified her, choking slightly on the words. Don't worry. You're safe now. I'm not going to let anyone take away your heart. Don't be afraid. Although Emmett wasn't far away, he still couldn't take those steps forward. He felt that if he didn't move forward, everything that had happened wouldn't be true. Shh, Lynn, I'm here now, I'm here now. Luke continued to coax her, tears now flowing freely down his face. Shh, don't be afraid, I'm here to protect you. The moment he had seen Lynn in the operating room, he had been overcome with the urge to kill everyone present. He was furious that his precious sister had become the victim of such a horrifying crime. He knew how she could be at times, but she still didn't deserve anything like this. Lynn didn't listen to Luke's words. She just continued to scream crazily and hit him with her fists. Ian came forward, a sedative in his hand. 
He took Lynn's arms firmly and injected it into her. Soon she stopped screaming and fell asleep. Luke didn't let go of Lynn, but Ian didn't care. He lifted Ian's sweater to inspect the wound. He instructed, send her to the operating room immediately. Her wound is split open. It needs to be stitched up as soon as possible. In the operating room, where Luke and Emmett heard those words, they trembled. Ian tried to calm them by saying, I will suture the wound personally. Then she'll be taken to Mercy Hospital. Reluctantly, Luke let go of Lynn and let the nurse take her to the operating room. Only then did everyone around come back to their senses. They all rushed forward, trying to get information on what had happened. Mr. Morris, has your sister gone crazy? One of them asked. Why didn't you take her to Mercy Hospital right away? Does your family hate her? The second one queried. Is this your family's fault? Have you offended someone? Is that why they came after Lynn? The third person chimed in. Mr. Morris, what are you planning to do about this? The fourth person questioned. Every single word pierced their hearts. The people didn't care about those involved at all. They were just asking about whatever they wanted to know, specifically saying particularly hurtful things. Ian frowned, but Luke only snorted. He raised his bloodshot, angry eyes at the people before him. I swear that I will catch the person who hurt my sister. They will pay a hundred times over for what they did. Neither I nor my family will be wasting time with all of you. All that interests me is getting justice for Lynn. If any of you dare come close to my family, I will end you. You better watch out, he growled. His words were strong and impactful, silencing the entire crowd. Luke turned around and left with Ian his back straight and tense as he walked away. Suddenly, nobody understood why people had looked down on him before. Luke's bloodthirstiness had been brought completely to the light by the threat of his sister's life. Madison watched Luke through the television screen in a daze. She had only seen him like this once before. This had been when he had appeared outside the school while she was being pestered. It had been partially because of that she had decided to become his girlfriend. However... After that time, she had never seen him like that again, until now. This Luke couldn't be manipulated into doing what others wanted. Allie watched the broadcast, her heart quivering in her chest. She wondered if they would have died like the others if they had been a little slower. Would they have been hollowed out and left as empty shells? She placed her hand on her abdomen, scared. At the Thompson family home, Ellie awoke from a deep sleep. As soon as she opened her eyes, she felt a wave of hatred coming over her. Damn Madison, she ruined everything for me, she cursed in her mind. If it hadn't been for Lynn's anesthesia, and the fact that she had heard Luke outside the door, she would have been caught. She had done everything flawlessly, but had still been ruined by Madison. The phone rang, and Ellie recognized the familiar number. Her face paled, and she quickly picked up. Obediently, she greeted... Hello, Hades. Hades was on the international wanted list. He was someone Shane knew about very well. According to the rumors, everyone who had ever offended him had ended up with their organs removed while they were alive. His victims had no choice but to watch in horror as they were operated on. But what was even worse about him was that he kept the empty shells of the people and turned them into specimens. Allegedly, there were dozens of such specimens inside his house. Shane had spent some time undercover at Taylor University because he had received intelligence that Hades had a client there. Hades laughed lightly into the phone and said lazily, Ellie, didn't you say that you had everything arranged? Then tell me, how did this happen? We had a deal. I sell you a heart, and you provide me with the fresh organs of ten people. But all I have is three bodies. His voice was low and deep, pleasant to the ear. However, the words that he spoke were haunting. Ellie sat up in bed, her eyes swimming with fear. Her voice trembled as she said, I really did arrange everything. I emptied out the hospital, and I chose the three patients. I didn't know. I didn't know that things would turn out like this. I swear I didn't know. Hades snorted, and a tense pause ensued. Finally, he muttered, Remember that you still owe me seven people. Only then will I give you Lynn's heart. 
His words sent Ellie spiraling. He hung up, not waiting for her to answer. Ellie sat there with no idea what to do. She had searched her whole life to find Lynn, her suitable heart donor. But now, because of Madison's interruption, not only had she lost her heart source, but she had also angered Hades. Her hands clenched into tight fists, the hatred in her eyes a burning fire. She vowed to get back at Madison for what she had done. Soon after, Lynn was transferred to Mercy Hospital, and Ian became the only doctor that the family trusted. If it hadn't been for his promise that the psychiatrist and neurologist were trustworthy, Lynn may not have been able to receive effective treatment. The family was terrified of making the same mistake again. No matter what examination she was undergoing, even if it was something that one of the doctors suggested, they would call Ian up to ask him for his opinion. Even when Zoe woke up, she repeatedly asked him to keep an eye on her daughter. The doctors felt helpless, but they sympathized with Lynn. She had gone through an incredibly traumatic experience. Ian was busy the entire night, and when he finally got off work, he bumped into Shane at the hospital entrance, and the two agreed to go to a nearby cafe. When they sat down, Ian sized Shane up. He had chased two criminals all by himself, and Ian wanted to know if he had been hurt, but just didn't want to go to the hospital. What were you doing there in the middle of the night? Shane asked him, his tone friendly. Ian frowned and looked at him silently. Is he interrogating me? He thought. Shane wasn't in a hurry. He just smiled at Ian. However, the determination in his eyes were visible. Madison's friend was in the hospital. We went there to pick her up. Ian informed him in an attempt to stall. He also wanted to get home as soon as possible. If you want information, you can go to the police station and have a look at my statement. I have nothing else to say. After that, Ian got up and prepared to leave. Did you know that Lynn was being prepped for surgery in an operating room with two tables? He asked, successfully stopping Ian in his tracks. He turned around and eyed Shane suspiciously. The other three victims had their organs removed in rooms with just one table. Are you thinking about organ transplant surgery? Ian asked softly. This was the only thing he thought Shane could be alluding to. Shane shrugged, and Ian became even more suspicious. He knew that Shane had wanted to study medicine earlier in his life. However, he wasn't an expert in the field, and to Ian's knowledge hadn't touched the subject for years. How could he tell what was going on just from seeing the scene? But then again, it is his job to notice these things and put them together, Ian thought. Ian returned to his seat and looked at Shane. Frowning, he asked, Do you have any idea who's behind this? Shane lowered his head and took a sip of coffee. He didn't answer Ian's question out loud, but Ian understood. This was the reason he had sneaked into Taylor University. He had been trying to catch the person behind this, or even someone related to them. His mind went to Madison, who was still a graduate student there, and his brows furrowed. Madison will be fine, right? Did the men see her yesterday? He thought. Questions flooded his brain, and he became a little irritated. If the person I'm looking for is behind this, you can rest assured that he won't touch anyone who hasn't provoked him. Shane said in a low voice. Hades was like that. He wouldn't go after someone he didn't have a personal issue with. Ian relaxed a little and thanked Shane. Then he said goodbye and left. He remembered that Allie's grandmother had passed away the previous day. He also recalled that Allie was pregnant. Back at the apartment, Madison finally managed to relax a little. Olivia hadn't been over in a while and Madison got Allie to sleep in the guest room. Then she sat alone in the living room and watched the television. From time to time, she would glance at the clock. However, her phone screen remained dark throughout the night. The events of the previous night were still all over the news. The reporters were all talking about Lynn and organ trafficking. The subject was being given an incredible amount of attention, the attention it hadn't received before. When Ian got back to the apartment, Madison had already fallen asleep on the couch, exhausted. 
When she heard him coming toward her, she woke up. She got up and ran over to him, not even putting on her slippers. Ian, she called out to him softly, merely wanting to greet him and say his name. Ian looked down at her bare feet and frowned. He put his keys away and accompanied her to the bedroom. Softly, he told her, you really are trying to catch a cold. She gave him a small smile. She knew that Allie was fast asleep and wouldn't wake for a while, and this made her a little calmer than she had been before. When they reached the bed, she put her hand around his neck and felt her heartbeat ease a little at the contact. Her eyes were full of tenderness and affection. Ian sighed and kissed her lightly on the forehead. Then he turned around and went to the bathroom. Although some things were somewhat urgent, they could rest for a while. After all, he wasn't made of iron. After he took a bath and returned to the bedroom, Madison looked at him, still wide awake. Ian came toward her and said, Let's go to sleep. We'll get to things when we wake up. Madison nodded. Her mood was low, but she was already feeling better than she had before. They were both exhausted, and they quickly fell asleep, not waking up until four o'clock in the afternoon when Luke called. Madison got out of bed and went to check up on Allie. She was still fast asleep, and her complexion was looking much better already. Madison went into the kitchen to prepare something to eat. They had to look after their health before they could deal with the matter of Allie's grandmother. She knew that the old lady wouldn't have wanted Allie to neglect herself, especially when she was carrying a child. Ian remained on the phone for a while, comforting the Morris family, and only came out of the bedroom after he had hung up. In the hallway, he bumped into Allie, who had finally woken up because of her hunger. They nodded at each other and walked into the kitchen together. Madison tried hard to make herself look happy. Hey, sleepyhead, she greeted her friend. I made you some broccoli, your favorite. Let's all freshen up and eat. Allie forced a smile as she returned to the guest room to wash up and get dressed. When she returned, she joined Ian at the table. They had also gone to change their clothes and had waited for her with the food. She looked over the table, seeing all of her favorite dishes. Her eyes watered a little as she realized that the baby she was carrying wasn't her only family after all. She had Madison and Ian, who let her be herself and didn't criticize her. Most importantly, however, they protected her. She lowered her head to eat, and tears fell into her rice. Ian raised his eyebrows but didn't say anything. Once they had finished eating, Madison cleaned up and then followed Allie to Ian's car. They were going to go and take her grandmother's body to the funeral parlor. The road to the outskirts of the city was a little bumpy, and Madison was worried about how this would affect Allie. She tried to support her as much as she could during the ride, which warmed Allie's heart. They held hands as they headed toward their destination. The crime that had happened at the hospital the previous night had been so serious that it had completely drowned out the news of the bus accident. Other than the family members of the dead, nobody was paying attention to this. There weren't any reporters around when Madison and Allie got out of the car, only police officers. Allie stood at the edge of the cliff and looked down at the steep fall. She could see the black wreckage below, along with various items that had been scattered around. Tears flowed down Allie's face and Madison bit her lip, reaching out to support her friend. Allie's grandmother had raised her for so many years, and now she was lying down there. Ian was talking to the police, trying to get some information. The body wasn't in an unrecognizable state, as it sometimes happened. He arranged for her body to be transferred to the funeral parlor right away. First, however, they let Allie see her. When she saw the body, Allie cried softly. I'm sorry, Grandma. I'm sorry I was wrong. Madison hugged Allie tightly, caressing her back. Please don't be angry at me, Grandma. Please forgive me. I'll never do it again. I will take care of myself, I swear. As she spoke, she recalled how her grandmother had always ordered her around. Be at peace now. Ian took them to the funeral parlor. Allie was afraid that her grandmother's soul would be lonely if she left the place of the accident too soon. 
but in the end they all went together. Allie was heartbroken by the loss. The parlor was full of devastated people. Most of them were the family members of victims of the accident. They were all sobbing. After all, it was a hard thing to accept that someone they cared about had passed away. Allie's grandmother was taken to a small, cold room. They stood there for a moment, paying their respects. None of them noticed that someone had been following them ever since they had left the apartment. The person watching them lit a cigarette but didn't smoke it. He just let it burn on its own. Soon, a man walked over to him and looked at Ian, who was at the door. He said to the man, Hades, we should leave now. Hades looked over at him and threw away the cigarette. They turned to leave. Surely it can't be her. But that face, Madison. I hoped that fate would bring us back together again, he thought. It wasn't healthy for Allie to stay in the cold room for a long time, so Madison let her cry for a while before taking her away. There was a lot of work that would have to be done in preparation for the funeral. Allie's heart was so constricted with guilt as she left her grandmother's body behind that she almost couldn't breathe. On the way back into the city center, Madison asked, Why don't you stay at our place for a while? I'm really worried about leaving you alone right now. Allie stiffened and shook her head. I'm fine. Don't worry about it, she assured her. Madison frowned, unhappy with her response. If I find out who the father is someday... I'll tear him to pieces, she murmured. Allie's eyes met Ian's in the rear view mirror, but Madison didn't notice. In the end, Allie went back to her own place, and Madison told her that she would come and see her the next day. Madison and Ian went home, and Ian retreated into the study. Madison went to bathe, and when she came out, she was wearing a loose nightgown that complemented her graceful figure. She was very beautiful. Ian watched her with hooded eyes and set down the glass of water he had been holding in his hand. He got up and walked over to her. Madison was holding up a towel to her head, still drying her hair, and didn't notice the danger coming closer and closer to her. She was thinking about how good she felt after having taken a shower. However, before she could let out a comfortable sigh, he hugged her around the waist, surprising her. She could feel his hot breath on her neck, and he pressed his burning lips to her sensitive skin. The towel in her hand fell to the ground, and she blushed heavily. I think we should catch up with Allie, Ian whispered into her ear. He felt like he was seducing a good woman. Her body went numb under his touch, and he liked the effect that he had on her. With a small smile, he murmured, You should work hard. After all, we should also have some news for the people soon. Madison bit her lip, feeling conflicted. Allie was already pregnant, despite not being married or even having a stable partner. While Madison had already gotten married, but just couldn't take the next step. She didn't want Allie to be a mother so long before her. She remembered the deadline that Diana had given them for getting pregnant. It was already October, and they weren't even close to conceiving. No matter how hard she tried... She hadn't been able to break through that psychological barrier yet. She reached out and touched Ian's neck. She leaned in, her tender pink lips pressing against his own. Ian's breath became heavier in an instant. He pressed his palm against her waist and tried hard to get her to relax. They had tried to get intimate countless times since they had gotten married, but they hadn't succeeded yet. They didn't know if this time would be different. The temperature in the room rose bit by bit, and they leaned closely against each other. Ian pressed against her gently, and Madison breathed heavily. Then she began crying. He led her to the bed and covered her up in a blanket. He caressed her long hair softly and whispered, It's okay. We'll continue trying. There'll come a day when it will be okay. Madison bit her lip anxiously, her shoulders trembling. It had been a long time since they had gotten married, and they had been trying almost four or five times a week. However, there seemed to be nothing that they could do. 
When they had first gotten a little progress, Madison had been so happy. But now they were stagnating again. They had firmly stopped where they were and couldn't seem to move past that point. Madison didn't dare imagine what Diana would do if things continued like this. Madison, Ian began comfortingly. However, his body was tight, and he sounded like he was suppressing himself. It's fine. We just need to keep working at it. Madison's eyes were full of tears as she looked at her husband, her heart aching. She wanted to apologize to him. In the time she had known Ian, she had come to trust that he wouldn't force her to do anything that she didn't want to do. However, seeing all the tension pent up in him was making her feel extremely guilty. She stayed very still in his arms, not moving at all. Timidly, she whispered, I'm sorry, Ian. If it hadn't been for her fear of sex, her inability to take that step, and her cowardice, she would have given him what he needed, and he could have been happy. She kissed his chin lightly and steeled her heart. If she didn't manage to overcome her fear by the end of October, she would force herself to accept everything. For Ian, that night was like the many other nights that they had failed. He had to go to the bathroom to take a cold shower and cool himself down. Every time he had Madison in his arms, he wanted to press her into the mattress and devour her. He held a palm to his forehead and sighed. She was bringing out all sorts of animalistic desires in him. The funeral went by very smoothly, and afterward, Allie went back to Green to work. Madison accompanied her throughout the day. When they went up into the building, Jason greeted them. His brows were tightly knit, and his entire body gave off a sense of hidden anger. Perhaps this was because he was still young and his anger was very visible. Their co-workers were curious about what had happened, and they paused their work to watch them. Madison looked at Jason in surprise. He looked very put together, and if she hadn't known him before, she would have never guessed what a sunny personality he normally had. All that sunshine was now concealed by his mature visage. Allie felt that Jason's anger was directed at her, and she was confused. She wondered how she had offended him. He had always been a gentleman. When did he become so scary, she thought. Did I do something, she asked him. After leaving the university, their relationship had been especially good. Now they were even working at the same company, and she didn't want to lose a friend. I'm sorry if I've done something to offend you, she murmured. Madison stood beside them, feeling a little awkward. Why is he acting like this, she thought. He opened his mouth, but didn't say anything. He only moved aside to let them pass through. His expression remained the same. Did you do something to him? Madison asked softly, confused. She glanced back at Jason. His expression was still extremely dark. It's weird that he would just show up angry like that. He's always had a really good temper. Her brain was working fast, trying to understand the situation. This must be because of her pregnancy. But why would that upset him? She thought. Madison ignored Jason and accompanied Allie into the office. Jason followed in after them. Anna looked at the three of them and felt a headache coming on. They seemed tense, yet they weren't normally the kind of people to act like this. Is something the matter? She asked, closing the folder in front of her. Anna, there's something I need to tell you. Allie announced as she sat down opposite her. Jason stood at the very corner of the office, not saying anything. Madison was also keeping silent. I'm pregnant. I would like to continue working at the company, and I hope you can give me this opportunity. Anna frowned and glanced at Allie's abdomen. Pregnant? But she isn't married, Anna thought. As a strictly religious woman... Anna didn't like the idea of a couple having a child out of wedlock, and so she didn't like the idea of Allie continuing to work under her at Green. She opened the folder before her and said, I didn't think you were married. You'll need to bring me your marriage certificate for our company records, or at least introduce me to your fiancé. Allie's face turned pale, and Madison frowned. They both knew how Anna could make things difficult for Allie. Just 
tell Anna who the father is, Madison persuaded softly. She felt her hatred for the irresponsible man growing. If you don't have this job, you won't be able to provide for the baby. This was all clear to Allie, but she just bit her lip and remained silent. Her hands were clenched into fists, and she was trembling slightly. She couldn't tell them who it was. She didn't want to. Even if she told them, they would only take it as a joke, so there was no reason for her to tell the truth. Anna looked at Allie in disappointment. She was very satisfied with Allie's abilities in the workplace, but she was disappointed in her as a person now. All the remaining color quickly drained from Allie's face. Madison held onto her hand anxiously, unable to understand why she wouldn't just reveal the father's identity. I'm the father. The word shocked everyone in the room. They had come from Jason, who had been silent the entire time. Madison stared at Jason, unwilling to believe what he had just said. Anna narrowed her eyes and didn't say anything. Allie was also shocked by Jason's words, and she turned around to look at him in surprise. He's the father? What a mess, Madison thought. Jason walked over and stood beside Allie. He reached out his hand and placed it gently on her shoulder. He looked into her eyes and announced, The child is mine. I'm the father. He didn't even give Allie the time to recover from his words before turning to Anna. I'm so sorry for the confusion. We're both sorry. We wanted to tell all of you earlier, but it just wasn't possible. The truth is that we got married in secret, he stated. Madison felt the corners of her mouth twitching. Secretly married, she thought. Anna was also shocked by this revelation. After a moment, she seemed to adjust to the situation and gave them a few words of advice before letting them out. From what they had understood, Anna was satisfied with the situation. Madison looked at the two of them, suspicious. She didn't doubt the authenticity of Jason's words, but was curious about how the two of them had gotten together. Allie frowned. It wasn't obvious if she was just tired or if she was embarrassed, but her face was a little red. One of Madison's former colleagues saw her and came over to greet her. She seemed a little worried and said, You should come back and watch over the company after this scandal with Allie. She's so irresponsible to get pregnant like this. Another colleague heard what she had said and called out in shock. Pregnant? What? Everyone in the office looked over. Behind them, Jason let out a sigh. However, Madison knew how to save the situation. Loudly enough for everyone to hear, she asked, So, when did you guys get married? In an instant, the mood in the office changed. Madison could see that the looks on Allie's and Jason's faces weren't happy, and she thought that they were in the middle of an argument. When she thought about how busy Jason had been with organizing the funeral, she realized that it had been quite obvious that there was something between the two of them. You know, I wouldn't have known that they were married if Allie hadn't gotten pregnant, Madison said, somewhat hurt that Allie had kept this from her. She gave Jason a disapproving look. Her two best friends had gotten together and hidden it from her. If Jason hadn't spoke up about it just then, Allie might not have been able to continue working at the company. For a moment, the news of their marriage swept across green like a tornado. Many people came forward to congratulate them, full of blessings and well wishes. Madison was worried that the swarming people would hurt Allie, and she stepped forward to keep them away from her. Once most of them had gone away, Jason came to stand close by Allie. He looked down at her and with a light scoff said, You're not worthy of being Madison's friend. With just that one sentence, Allie felt sick. She began trembling. Does he know? What can he know? What if he knows everything? She thought, panicking. Jason looked at Allie's flustered expression, and his own expression worsened, the smile on his lips getting colder by the second. He said, From the day you made your choice, you've been destined to lose Madison. She clenched her jaw tightly, and tears stung her eyes. However, her determination didn't falter. She had only done something that many girls wanted, but didn't dare to do. She didn't understand why she was receiving so much criticism. 
Once she had left Green, Madison didn't go straight home. Instead, she went to Mercy Hospital. She had heard that Lynn was still staying there, and when she thought of Luke and what he must have endured, she was worried. She had a bad feeling about what Luke had said on television. But she didn't end up visiting Lynn and Luke. Instead, she bumped into Bruce. He was waiting in one of the hallways, seemingly at a loss for what to do. Madison greeted the doctors and nurses that she recognized and then went up to Bruce. Hi, she greeted him. What are you doing here? He turned to her in surprise, and his eyes filled with an emotion Madison didn't quite understand. It seemed like a mixture of excitement, confusion, happiness, and worry. She sized him up and frowned. Are you okay? she asked. Have you been injured? Bruce shook his head and said, No, I just came by to see a friend. Has your friend been hospitalized? she asked, smiling gently. In Bruce's eyes, she was incomparably gentle. Is it serious? Which room are they in? He looked a little nervous, but before he could say anything, he heard the voice of the person he had come to see. Madison, Ian called out, his voice serious. Ian walked over and raised his eyebrows at the two of them. The corners of his mouth raised into a mocking smile. Are you busy today? Madison asked her husband. Would you like to accompany me to the mall? I'd like to buy some things for Allie's baby. I need to think of what to get. Ian's gaze became gentle again, and he reached out to touch her hair. I'm really busy right now. Do you mind going alone? I'll come by to pick you up later, he stated. Madison nodded. She had initially wanted to check up on Lynn, wondering if she could meet Luke. But now she had decided against it. The Morris family was going through a tough time, and it wouldn't be appropriate for her to go visit them. Dr. Weston, the patient in bed 63 needs you. A nurse ran over, panting as she spoke. The matter seemed very pressing. Ian glanced at Madison and left. Have you seen your friend? Madison asked Bruce. He nodded quickly, not yet having recovered from seeing the smile on Ian's face as he had spoken to Madison. If you have time, we could go to the mall together. Bruce answered her with a smile. On the way to the shopping center, Bruce sat beside Madison and asked, The two of you seem to have a good relationship. Have you known each other for a long time? Madison smiled. When she thought back on her proposal to him, she wanted to laugh. Our relationship is okay, she said. However, she didn't answer Bruce's question. Bruce relaxed a little as they continued to chat. The topic would occasionally steer toward Ian, and Madison finally realized that something was off. She looked at him carefully until he got embarrassed. Why are you so curious about him? Do you know each other? She asked. Bruce shook his head and said, I know him, but I don't think he knows me. I just think he's a really powerful man. He had to be a powerful man. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to find his mother, who had been hiding away for over twenty years, concealing her abilities. He had been the only one who had managed to find her. A really powerful man, Madison repeated his words in her mind, unsure of what they meant. She assumed that he was praising Ian and smiled. They arrived at the mall and went inside. They continued chatting as they bought all kinds of things for Allie and the baby. Madison began thinking that it was surely Bruce's dream to become a doctor, and she encouraged him to study medicine in the future. They finally went outside. Madison looked at the bags in Bruce's hands and felt a little embarrassed for having him shop with her. To show her thanks, she offered to treat him to a meal, and Bruce accepted with a smile. They were on their way over to a restaurant when they saw an old lady selling little handmade shoes. It was a type that all small children wore, and Madison had to stop and look at them. They were exactly the type of shoes she would like to get her own child someday. Bruce watched her from a side and asked, When are you and Dr. Weston planning on having a baby? We can buy a pair for your child then. Madison didn't say anything. She just bought two identical pairs, one for Allie and one for her own child. As she was paying, she saw a group of people at the end of the street, running toward them and screaming. Bruce subconsciously took a step forward to protect Madison, 
and frowned as the lady with the stall quickly packed up her things and left. He pushed Madison out of the crowd's way. At the same time, a gunshot rang out, and Madison's body stiffened. The previous night's events came flooding into her mind once again. She grabbed Bruce and started running away, the toys and clothes spilling from the bags in her hands. They lost everything except for the shoes, which Madison was still gripping tightly. The continuous gunshots numbed Madison's ears, and the movement in her feet became faster and faster. Police cars drove by, but the shooting didn't stop. The crowd was becoming more and more difficult to control as everyone tried to get away. This way, Bruce called out to her. She was running slowly now, and someone in the crowd always managed to knock into her. Bruce did his best to protect her, but there were times when he couldn't do anything. He pulled her to the side into a flower bed, and they heaved a sigh of relief when they saw the people rushing past them. At first, they had thought that the people would leave, but when the sound stopped, their faces turned pale. They were surrounded.